Welcome to the Catholic Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Levi Russell, and today is August 27th, 2020. So today I have uh, an interesting article from the Wall Street Journal, and I'll put links to everything. Uh, the, the article is paywalled, so hopefully you have access to some kind of library services. If not, uh, and you want to read it, send me an email. Um, so this article is really interesting. There's a thread on Twitter from the author, Christopher Mims, and I'll, I'll leave a link to that as well and a, and a really interesting image uh, graph that, that I'm going to be talking about. So this article tackles a lot of the automation kind of discussion that we have. And just to kind of set the stage here. So when we've talked about uh, in, in the past these ideas around the uh, the suicide rate, the, the deaths of despair and stuff like this, especially hitting places like Appalachia and other areas of the country as well. Uh, a lot of the discussion has uh, rotated around this whole idea of jobs and what public policy is doing to hinder um, you know, job security and things like that in these areas. And you kind of have two uh, competing theories on this. One is that uh, it's a combination of trade policy and uh, automation and things like this that have uh, created these issues. And the other is the other perspective, I think, as far as I have seen, is this idea that it's well, it's really just trade. The reason the reason a lot of these manufacturing jobs from the Midwest and from Appalachia and areas like that have moved overseas is because our trade policy, um, uh, you know, really did it. And so we have kind of those two. And then there's even some people who say it's all just automation. Oh, our lives are so much better off because uh, automation has has made the price of uh, our products go down because, you know, we use less labor uh, to create those things now. So even if, you know, some people are out of a job, you know, hopefully they can find something else to do. And hopefully they, uh, uh, you know, will will benefit from the cheaper goods. So maybe there's three competing ideas there, but I think I'm probably in the first camp where it's, I think it's a combination of both. I think our trade policy has um, certainly offshored a lot of our jobs. Maybe that's hard to measure. Uh, you know, anytime we're talking about counterfactuals and economics, it's difficult to measure these things. But what's so interesting about this article uh, from the New York, uh, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal is uh, Christopher Mims, who, at least from my reading at the beginning of this article, kind of seems like a lefty type. Uh, but he, he does, uh, I think what he's saying here fits into sort of a pro-labor kind of uh, argument, even from the right. And what's interesting about this is that um, we're, we're seeing some uh, discussion here about the way policy has artificially propped up the automation side of things. So I think leaving aside this idea that uh, automation is automatically good for everyone, uh, which is obviously nonsense, I think, um, you can you, you could probably get some people who are just really bought into the, the ethics and the morality of, uh, you know, whatever the market will bear, right? There are people who have basically farmed their, their ethics out to an economics textbook, which is really bad. Um, you know, they, they'll say that this is fine, but w what Mims basically says in here is that the, uh, is that policy has been subsidizing, um, automation by basically taxing software and hardware less than labor. And what's interesting is that, you know, MEMS probably wouldn't like this much, but this fits into a narrative uh, and into a policy regime that Trump has really been promoting. And so I'll talk about that a little bit here. So I think there's another question here that is maybe interesting from an economic theory standpoint. And if you want me to talk about this more in a, in a separate episode, please let me know. But there's this idea of... Um, is differential taxation a subsidy? So like, because like Mim says here, and, and I'll, and I'll share a, a really great graph. Um, I'll have a link to it um, in his Twitter thread. He shows that the tax rate on hardware and software is much, much lower than the tax rate on labor. And so, you know, does that amount to a subsidy? You know, just taxing something less 
than it, than its substitute mean that you're subsidizing it. Um, and there's a, there's a there's a significant liberal economics argument that in fact no that's not the case um and and so I, I i can get into that in a different episode and we can talk about the the idea that you know there's some kind of default position and and so taxation moves us away from that default um but i i want to save that for a different discussion if you're interested in it so if you are interested in it you know hit me up on twitter uh send me an email my email's in uh in in the the description of this uh video or this show so what Mims does here is he, uh, I want to re read a little um, spot from this article at the end. And so he's, he's quoting a PhD candidate from Harvard uh, in this beginning, the, the, the first part of this paragraph I'm going to read. So it says, a big share of the increase in inequality is because of public policy, says Anna Stansbury, a PhD candidate in economics at Harvard University, who has examined the impact of the decades-long decline in the power of workers. The trend Miss Stanberry believes had the biggest impact include a decline in unions and unionization, a culture of managerial ruthlessness at some companies, the rise of private equity and leverage buyouts, and an excessive focus on shareholder value. So, of course, I mean, you know, you're going to hear that from a Ph.D. student at Harvard, I guess, right? Uh, so going on with the article, a fundamental tenet of most economists thinking is that in the long run, innovation is a tremendous net benefit to human civilization. As long as we can thread the eye of the needle of environmental catastrophe, increased productivity has the potential to continue to reduce global poverty, quash childhood disease, better the lot of the world's most vulnerable, and expand the global middle class. The challenge, argue uh, doctors Autor, Asimoglu, and many others, is reducing the short and medium-term harms meted out to those whose lives and livelihoods are being disrupted right now. And so, of course, he's talking here about the... Uh, the affliction and all that sort of thing. And he talks about in this article how, you know, the, the whole uh, affliction policy has really moved up the adoption of a lot of technologies. And we just saw uh, yesterday, I saw a piece saying that uh, Jeff Bezos, the, uh, the CEO of Amazon and creator of Amazon uh, is now worth $200 billion. Uh, he's the first person to ever hit that number. And it's, you know, to me, it's striking because, you know, that's obviously a, uh, a transfer from Main Street, you know, during this whole affliction thing. So in Mims' th uh, Twitter thread on this article, he, he talks about effective tax rates for U.S. companies by type of expenditure. And so um, essentially he calls this a robot subsidy. <laughs> and the... the um, the, the 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 tax rates on labor are pretty consistent at uh, say 25 to 28 um, percent again these are effective tax rates so that means it's like uh, the the percentage of taxes you pay as a share of the total expenditure on that thing um, and then the tax rate for software and equipment has never been as high as labor ever and it has declined over time kind of in fits and starts and is now somewhere at uh, somewhere close to 5%. And so the thing is here, what struck me is, well, the obvious solution to this, and, and, and Mims doesn't even say this in the article, the obvious solution to this is to get rid of the payroll tax. Because of course, uh, you know, this, if we're talking 25%, the, the tax rate on labor, at least under a certain um, wage rate, um, you know, if you, if you make, if you make well into the six figures, then obviously this doesn't really apply because the social security tax caps out at 128,000 or something like that. But <clears throat> the thing is that if we, <laughs> the, the reason this is a problem is because of FICA taxes. So FICA is your, is, is, uh, the insurance, uh, the unemployment insurance money and social security, right? That's what this, this, uh, fundamental tax rate is. And so if you work for somebody, then you'll see on your, on your pay stub, you'll see like a seven, I think it's 7.6% is what you pay. So 7.6% of your salary just automatically goes into these programs to pay for unemployment and stuff. And I'm not saying that unemployment and all those things, unemployment insurance and all that stuff is bad. Uh, in general, I'm just saying the way we fund it is really uh, is really 
harmful to labor in the market uh, relative to software and hardware. So, uh, and again, I, when I say labor, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, some kind of Marxist concept or, or you know, some kind of uh, class distinction. I'm saying labor as an input into production processes, right? I'm talking about labor as something that, uh, you know, businesses use. And so, you know, we're currently, I don't know, 26% or so on this graph as a, the effective tax rate for labor. Well, that 7.6% you pay is mirrored on your employer's side. So they also pay 7.6% of your salary uh, into these programs. And so, you know, you put those two together and it's somewhere north of 15% uh, right off the bat. And then, of course, you've got... Um, uh, you know, income taxes and, and, and a whole range of other taxes that would go into this. Um, so I think what's interesting here is maybe MIMS wouldn't like it. And, you know, the Wall Street Journal isn't, uh, isn't known for being pro-Trump or anything. But these two, but, but all of this together to me, uh, and, and earlier in the article, he talks about the K-shaped recovery where, you know, some, some businesses are going up and doing well, you know, the stock market's soaring and then Main Street and a lot of lower income people are just, you know, falling off the cliff and not doing well at all. Um, but this seems to make the case for getting rid of payroll taxes as a policy, just get rid of them and find another source of taxation. And then specifically, I mean, I don't know, let's increase the taxes on software and equipment. I don't have a problem with that. I would, I would, I would guess, and I don't know this, but I would guess. I haven't read these papers, but my guess would be that this reduction in software and equipment has to do with uh, a lot of the depreciation expensing and and that kind of thing uh, that really is uh, uh, bonus depreciation. All these things that have been uh, big time policies in the last uh, I don't know twenty years or so. So I, I, my guess would be that that is where some of this is coming from. And, and so you, you, can, you can understand, you, you know, abstracting away from this whole idea of the, um, you know, whether this is a subsidy or, you know, this differential tax makes up a subsidy or, or not. It's, it's kind of interesting to see here that um, these tax rates are so different and that such an obvious policy of just simply shifting the tax code uh, because because getting rid of um, of, of uh, these FICA taxes, getting rid of payroll taxes in general, would have so many benefits. I mean, number one, we would we would have we would end the incentive for employer based health insurance. I mean, that's why we have employer based health insurance is because of payroll taxes. Um, and I I think I've talked about that before in a previous episode. Maybe I'll do another one on that kind of thing. Um, but that. That's really why we have employer-based health insurance and why it's, your health insurance isn't just like the other types of insurance you have for your car or your house or whatever. Um, and so we would, we would end that uh, kind of distortion, which would be a really good thing in my mind. Um, we, could, we could go back to uh, something closer to the, uh, the mutual aid society model, or at least it would make that model easier uh, to, to, uh, to finance. Um, we, so, so that's just, that's one other side benefit of this besides just getting rid of this, um, differential taxation on labor. And, and so imagine, you know, if you and your employer both just all of a sudden have this completely different set of, uh, incentives as far as your work, right? So you, you get paid more you get that 7% back off of your check and your employer gets that 7% back. Now, ideally, obviously we have to figure out how to pay the bills for the country, right? We can't just uh, print money and inflate away um, all of our problems because uh, I mean, maybe that works out for a while, but eventually that's going to go really bad, um, really poorly. So obviously we would have to find another way to tax that. And so it might be that the, uh, the, the, the burden, the actual tax burden itself shifts a little bit. And so what we would hope, I think, is that, number one, we could get rid of this disincentive to employ labor, right? And we could uh, slow down the, the automation process uh, that has really accelerated thanks to the whole affliction policy, the lockdowns and all that nonsense. Um, maybe, again, maybe, maybe you think it's not nonsense. I, you know, whatever, but the, the point is that I think in, in a lot of areas, uh, it's obvious that this either was a bad idea or it's not necessary anymore. And so, 
uh, why, why we're not going back to normal. I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is that, uh, there, there has been an acceleration in this automation stuff. In my mind, it's very clear that this is a large part of the, uh, the, the job issues, and that's tied in with these deaths of despair. I think that makes sense. And this would be a way for us to alleviate some of that and to really change the um, kind of the perspective that people have. Because, again, we, we, we talk about, as Mims talks about in here, you know, most economists are going to say that, well, you know, automation is a great thing. And, and hopefully that uh, that automation makes us all wealthier, even the people who are put out of their jobs. But, um, you know, we have to factor risk in here somewhere. And risk is never factored in when we're talking about sort of ad- average GDP per capita um, or whatever these measures of the benefits of automation are. Um, they're really not. And he does mention, too, in the article that a lot of the jobs, uh, strangely enough, right, a lot of these jobs that come out of automation uh, that, that are created due to this automation stuff um, are actually more dangerous than uh, the jobs that existed before. And so, you know, we have this idea that, uh, you know, well, everybody was, uh, you know, doing all these really super dangerous jobs. And now that we have all this equipment and all this automation, um, that our, our jobs are safer, but he alleges in here, and I'm not sure if he has some kind of citation for that. Um, but I'm sure there's a link in the actual wall street journal article. Mine is just a, a ProQuest uh, document. So there's no, there's no links or anything. Um, but uh, allegedly he has some kind of reasoning for that. Uh, so I, I think this is an interesting piece. I think it's an interesting subject and it's really, uh, it really tells you, I think how, how much, uh, president Trump really has his finger on the pulse of this kind of issue, um, where the, the payroll tax isn't just some kind of, uh, you know, populist giveaway that there actually might be good reasons for, why you would want to get rid of a payroll tax. And again, like I said, healthcare, uh, the whole healthcare market just completely gets changed, uh, or at least it could be changed. This would at least allow for it to change. Um, whereas now it really can't because of the incentives in place on the taxation. And it also gives us a, a possibility for kind of reevaluating automation. And it, and it just, it really just gives us a level playing field, which again, the liberal economists are all about level playing fields, right? Uh, we would have a level playing field with respect to labor versus, um, uh, you know, automation, capital, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in this graph, it's software and equipment. So I think this is an interesting topic and I think I, I want to hear your thoughts on it. So if you have, uh, if you have a perspective on this, I, I would love to hear about it uh, on the, uh, you know, on my Twitter or something like that. And uh, so in, in, in this vein, you know, I'm always talking about uh, buying local and supporting uh, Catholic businesses. Obviously, this is a Catholic podcast. So I want to make you aware of a great business run by a young Catholic couple. Colette's Carvings makes beautiful wooden plaques for your home. I bought one of the first ones they made for my son's room. He's named after St. Francis Xavier, and Colette's Carvings did a masterful job making a custom wall hanging to honor his namesake. Themes range from saints to custom family and nursery signs to holiday decor. Devotionals and decor from your from our home to yours. Check out Colette's Carvings on Etsy at the link in the show notes. So, uh, again, you know, I think there's another side to all of this that um, we have to contend with. And that is this idea that while the automation has been a negative thing, um, we also have to see that a lot of these, um, a lot of these innovations uh, and the reduction in the cost of some of these uh, different um, manufacturing processes has really kind of given us the ability to have a kind of uh, cottage industry kind of thing again. So, the, the fact that we have 3D printers, uh, they used to call those uh, stereo lithography, right? Uh, the fact that you can get a 3D printer, and, and you know, maybe it's going to cost you a few grand, but you can get a 3D printer in your house. You can get um, one of these um, decal printing machines, and people have very successful businesses based on just having, you know, one of these decal printers in their house, and they just make decals and sell them on social media. So the social media itself is uh, uh, some kind of, you know, technological type of innovation that allows them to market it. 
there's uh, these decal machines. We've got uh, 3D printers that people can make uh, small parts and pieces like that. They can make um, uh, things for, uh, I mean, I see a lot of this in like replacement parts for cars and stuff. I mean, there's a thriving market on eBay uh, for all these replacement parts at a tiny fraction of what a dealer would charge for this kind of thing. There's um, there's even relatively inexpensive machines that do a lot of engraving and carving in wood, and that's actually uh, the sponsor for today, Colette's Carvings. They they have a machine like this, and I think the thing's like I don't know five or six thousand uh, dollars, which sounds like a lot of money, but I mean you can make beautiful stuff with these. And, uh, and again, social media being this innovation, so now we've got. This it's almost like we've kind of come full circle, right? It's the the industrial revolution pulled everybody out of the home and put them in factories, and now we're at the point where even if you want to be at home, you can work, um, and you can have even you can even have a business with capital. So it's sort of like a blessings and curses kind of thing here. I think it's a it's a combination for all of the people who uh, really were trained and grew up in the mold of the industrial or mining um, world, the things that you, you still can't do at home, uh, you know, they have had, they have really been hurt by a lot of this. And I think that there's, there's a generational component to some of this. Uh, and there's also kind of a just a way of life distinction here to be made because, you know, is it good? Uh, for us, you know, I mean, this is the modern world, right? This is, uh, you know, Pope Leo's, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, um, you know, the the inaugural uh, uh, encyclical on Catholic social teaching it was called "New Things, Rerum Novarum." I mean, these this is just the way the world is going to be different now. The way we can't go back to uh, 1350 as much as we would love to. Um, we 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 aren't going back there, and so this whole idea of uh, the fact that so much of our productivity and so much of our um, our, our livelihood is based on these manufacturing the manufacturing sector uh, that's not going away even with these uh, innovations we have at home with these uh, these wonderful tools like um, these carving machines and decal I mean it, really that's 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 a that's really a part of a very high income consumer society, right? That we have the money that, that to, to support industries like these, where we're just, somebody's just making decals to put on, you know, your window or something, um, or to put on your, your wall or your vehicle or whatever. Um, so I, th I think there's, there's a sense in which we can say that this automation has kind of redeemed itself, uh, by allowing us to have these kind of great side gigs. And again, where, you know, maybe even Chesterton would have liked this because, you know, now you, you can own part of that business and it doesn't have to be through a cooperative or uh, some kind of fundamental restructuring of the business. Um, you can just simply own your own business in your home and have a job where you, you go and make wage income and also at the same time, you uh, you have some kind of capital of your own that you're you're able to make money on, so I don't think it's a I don't think it's necessarily a settled question whether this whole automation thing is just definitely bad or definitely good. I think there are ways in which it has been good and bad, and I think smart policy uh, is is what we need to try to uh, settle this question. And um, I, I think that smart policy a, a good first step on that is to. Uh, again, using the, the phrases from the liberal types uh, to level the playing field a little bit and allow uh, labor a little bit more of uh, uh, kind of the ability to uh, compete with all this automation. And at least, you know, again, this is generational and, and, and we're not we can't expect a 60 year old to just uh, completely throw away the last 40 years of their life and figure out something new. I, I think that's, uh, I think that's just cold. And, and, you know, these, it's, what is it, what is a 60 year old going to do uh, when the plant shuts down, like go to college. Right. Um, and I mean, uh, yeah, Hey, I, I, there are a lot of 60 year olds that in my life that I, that I love very dearly, but um, I'm not going to expect them to figure out how to use uh, a, a 3d printer. I'm not going to expect them to figure out how to use these things because I mean, for Pete's sake, you know, uh, cell phones are tough enough on them. So uh, it's not to say they're dumb. Again, it's just a generational thing. Um, but 
so very interesting questions, and I think we're getting some interesting uh, information that changes our answers on these things and helps us to kind of look at things from a different angle. And maybe these maybe these issues really are more complicated uh, than just sort of sloganeering um, for one 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 party or the other, right? In that sense, um, and I in this case. I, I think that, uh, again, that first step of just getting rid of payroll taxes uh, is is a smart way to start. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, um, hit me up on Subscribestar or Patreon. Uh, but I really appreciate you sharing the show. I'm so glad that all of you are interested in hearing more about economics, especially from uh, a Catholic perspective. As you know, we could use more voices on the traditionalist right. And one of the best ways to do that is with a podcast. I've been using Anchor.fm for this podcast and for another podcast for over a year, and I've really enjoyed it. It's free, and it allows me to upload clips and also to record and edit. It also disperses all of my podcasts to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It also allows me to monetize and to collect donations. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If you want to join me in being a voice for the traditionalist right, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. (laughs) 